Okay, so um, we have time for some questions. Um, if anyone on in the room wants to, we've got microphone there. There's a microphone up here. I've got one online, and this one is for Alan from uh, Divaka Argawal. Can you explain the difference between spread and full change, and what is the balance between the two that we should ideally see and want in single cell data? Oops. Uh, hi, Devika. Thanks for the question. Um, so we, the way we measure fold change is to actually compute the change in um, the expression. And um, a spread change here would just be the change in the variance of um, um, the, the counts data. Um, right. So um, your second question, which is, uh, what is the, the correct balance between the two we should ideally see? Um, so I think I don't know the answer to that question. I think it really depends on um, the, con the, the, the conditions that we are looking at. And I think that's actually an open question. Um, I don't think maybe someone else in the room might know an answer to this. Okay. Questions from the audience here? Okay, we've got one. Thanks. Um, yes, I also have a question for Alan, uh, very similar to the one before. Uh, so I, I saw that, well, one question is uh, if you uh, take advantage of the association between abundance and spread, uh, like other methods do. Um, and uh, well, a second question is I was curious that for some of your hypothesis testing methods, those two variables were associated and for others, not, they did not. So I was curious, um, you know, if you had consideration about that. Right. So, um, sorry, I don't think I caught your, I got your first question. Could you repeat the first question? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's, it's known that abundance and, and variance are associated for, uh, you know, RNA sequencing abundance. And uh, some methods use this to regularize or shrink uh, the estimates. So I was curious if you had plans or if your method accounts for that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I think like, you know, that's the, one of the reasons uh, we, we explore different normalizations is because I think the normalizations in some ways um, can account for some of these, um, um, I guess, you know, like uh, we can call them confounders, right? Um, yeah, and I'm not so sure whether, um, um, again, I'm not the best person to talk about these, you know, like normalization uh, details, but I'm not so sure whether um, any of these normalizations that are considered in this application do account for the abundancy differences that you mentioned that are known to be associated with um, variances. Uh, yeah, but I do know, like, for example, there are so many um, um, other confounders, like, you know, the, the library sizes. And so that, I think that was one of the concerns um, uh, that uh, we, we we ran into like earlier on, you know, we weren't previously accounting for these differences when running the test. So we thought, um, why don't we just try it after we we do some pre-processing that accounts for like, uh, uh, you know, total counts per cell, right? Um, and and then you know, I think actually I went on, I went on the uh, bioconductor um, Slack channel and asked people what they thought about like you know um, ways to normalize uh, before running a D test. And I think there was no consensus based on like um, the people who replied. All right, I have Thanks. a question for um, Avi. Um, so if, in any time if you're going to be um, integrating across multiple data sets, how much does it matter that they were done on the same tissue type at the same species? Can you put together human and mouse? Can you take all the stuff from human and mouse and then put it onto dog or to cat? Um, just wondering about that. Come up here. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So here it's a little bit different. So we are working on PBMC. Uh, these are all uh, blood cells. Here it was easier because they're coming from the same tissue. But in general, integrating the data set for functional analysis like these, it's going to be tricky because even at single cell RNA seq, we are having difficulties integrating, let's say, um, uh, mouse or some other uh, other let's say model of organisms right so right now even with the known technology is difficult so right uh, so cut and tag is even newer so we can look into it but right now i haven't really explored that much okay. yeah. 
One more question for So I understand it's difficult from different different uh, organism and different tissue types, but the PBMC for like normal donor and the suppose cancer patient is that okay to run in a same uh, experiment like to see PBMC or how the CD8s are expressing in normal tissue and how the CD8s are expressing in cancer tissues. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and it's an important one because if you want to study, let's say, newer uh, cell type annotation because of, let's say, uh, disease, uh, the, the, the lineage just got changed into another kind of cell types, right? So right now we are doing supervised analysis. So I was talking about the reference annotation, right, where we are integrating everything into one framework. So it depends on what you have in the reference. Uh, the ultimate resolution is going to depend what you have in the reference uh, uh, to start with, right? You can you can imagine doing unsupervised analysis, right, where you have all the data set from, let's say, a disease state, and then you integrate everything together, right? And then it depends on what what kind of resolution you have even in the even in the let's say disease condition. So you can do supervised, unsupervised. But right now, this is right now. It's in the proof of concept concept stage. Uh, uh, it's done supervised uh, way, but it can be extended into unsupervised as well. And, and specifically, protein protein information is very useful, which can be used to split apart the cell type annotation. Okay. One more question. I will do one more question, and then we will take a break. Uh, hi, I have a question for Alan. Um, you mentioned for your methods that depending on which sort of st statistic or whether it's a shift or a scale statistic you want to test, you have to set the weights and the exponent differently. Is that something that you analytically have to derive or is there uh, some method to guide uh, for those settings of hyperparameters? Right. So thanks for the question. Um, so the, um, the short answer is that there are certain special cases where we can analytically derive it. Um, so that's actually the case where the exponent um, in the test statistic is equal to one. Um, um, otherwise, like you would have to, you know, basically do like a forward simulation over a grid to find the um, uh, optimal choices of, of, of parameters um, over that grid. Okay, well, let's thank all of our speakers once again, and we, and we will take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back for the next session. All right, thank you.